happening is I told you that I will show some photographs of some of the components that I have discussed in my last class. So I hope now you will see something on your screen. Something is coming? Yes, sir. Okay, so now this one I would like to show you. Right. Okay, not this one. First, I told you that uh, the static shield that I have told you in my last class. So now here you can see one photo. This is actually a transformer. Uh, now, but look at this. There are two, three things you can see here. First of all, this is called a bushing, which I was trying to tell you earlier. That transformer winding, it is inside this tank, whereas the, the high voltage connection, etc., is all outside. So this high voltage connection has to come out through the earthed tank. And therefore, here we require bushings and we don't require insulators and this is a high voltage bushing but importantly this is at the top you can see is called the static shield this static shield is typically has two purposes one this from the since this static shield is connected electrically to the top of the bushing so they are potential is same that means it is equal to the line voltage whatever be the voltage and then with respect to the static shield there is some capacitance that forms to different sections vertically different sections and they always come in parallel with the series capacitance so that effectively this parallel capacitance that is formed between the static shield and this series capacitance of this let's say this is the bushing but it can be a transformer winding also same concept so series capacitance increases and it helps in distributing the potential uniformly along the length this is true for any such very large high voltage object and if you look carefully at the earth end also there is a static shield so because at both the ends it helps in making the potential distribution uniform so here you can see this then uh, this bushing again i will show you another diagram this is exactly what i wanted to mean it's called the wall bushing now if you look at carefully that this is something is inside this house whatever it is it may be a laboratory inside but then uh, these terminals have come out through this uh, this wall and therefore here you don't require insulators here you require bushings and once again look at the static shield you can clearly see that the static shield is there at both the ends of the that particular bushing and here it is a, a three phase connection so you can clearly see that these are the three phases of that particular equipment whatever is inside This is a diagram which exactly shows you that how a bushing is constructed. You can see this is on the top of the transformer tank, where at the back side you can see this is a good one, a good bushing, whereas this one is damaged. And now if you look at it, it this is typically the, it is called porcelain bushing. Bushings are of different type. This is called porcelain bushing. So you can see the cylindrical part at the center or at the axis. 
Actually, this is also an insulation. In between, there is a conductor, which actually runs through this tank. Then on the conductor, there is typically a solid insulation. It could be paper. And then the outside, this is called the housing. This is made of the porcelain. This is called bushing housing. But then there is a gap between the porcelain housing and this central uh, insulated conductor, which is filled with oil. Now here at the bottom, you can see a conical structure. This is very typically used in this sort of bushing or even in cables where these connections are made. These are also called stress cones stress cones. They also help in distributing the electric field much more uniformly because this is the most critical part where the high voltage conductor passes through the tank because tank is at zero potential. So the most critical part is here. The most of the failure occurs here. So the stress cones are used for making the field uniform. This is another uh, important one and then another diagram I want to show you is this one that is the this is actually where you require insulators not pushing so this is where you can see the transmission line now here you the conductor is not passing through any arc body but it has to be supported so from the tower you can see we use the insulators for supporting the conductor. But interestingly, again, on the left hand side, you can see the stress shields at both the ends of the insulator string, these uh, toroidal structures. They also help in improving the potential distribution. Similarly, on the right side, this is actually called, uh, actually a termination of the transmission line. There is a difference between the left diagram and the right diagram. The left diagram, you can see the conductor is running through. Whereas in the right side, the left side conductor is being terminated. The right side conductor is terminated. And there is a jumper connection. This is called a jumper connection through which the left side and the right side is being connected. So this is typically a termination where there is a sharp angle of the transmission line. We use this sort of terminations where the angles are maintained. Otherwise, you know, if it is running through a conductor, these angles are difficult. So we use this sort of connection. And on the right side, another interesting thing you can see is called the bundle conductor system. So you can see the right side, any one conductor, it is not a single conductor. On the left side, you can see these are single conductors. On the left side, you can see there are three tower arms. So this is one three-phase circuit. On the right, another three are tower arms. So it's a, called a double circuit line. Whereas this is called a bundle conductor where you can see four conductors are, you can look at my mouse, four conductors are connected together. So they are all at same potential. So what happens is the current carrying capacity is four times. A skin effect is minimized. But at the same time, another important thing happens. That is the effective diameter of the conductor increases, which reduces corona significantly. So this is another very, uh, very, very interesting uh, aspect. So with this, I shift now uh, to uh, my other topic that is today's topic. So today's topic is this one. That is generation of high AC voltage through series resonance circuit. Now, typically a circuit is used, which is of this nature, where we have the low voltage source on the left side. The voltage regulator is used to vary the low voltage. 
then we use a transformer which is called the feed transformer where we step up the voltage now it serves two purposes first of all it can step up the voltage but necessarily we don't step up the voltage too high but another important aspect is we provide the electrical separation between the low voltage side to the high voltage side because if anything happens in the high voltage side we don't want that to be directly reflected on the low voltage side because of safety reasons so we always use a transformer in between so you can say this is part of voltage stepping up and part of electrical isolation then it is a very simple rlc circuit but point to note is that this c is not something which we connect this c is the load capacitance of the test object that means if i am testing a bushing this is the capacitance of the bushing if i am testing a cable it is the capacitance of the cable or if i am testing a porcelain insulator it will be the capacitance of the porcelain insulator the principle of operation is very very simple that we apply a voltage then this l that is put in the circuit is a variable inductor frequency is of course fixed that is 50 hertz so what we do for any particular load capacitance of any test object we vary this l and achieve series resonance and at that condition typically the current becomes maximum and whatever be the reactance of this c that is x c 1 by omega c multiplied by the voltage appearing across the capacitance and that will be the test voltage and since resonance is occurring it is occurring at one particular frequency and we always achieve a resonance at 50 hertz therefore we get what is called a pure sinusoid across the capacitor because the resonance is occurring only at one frequency but here are some points to be noted let us say that we are testing a porcelain insulator typically they have very low capacitance say for example here it is shown that it is 10 to the power 3 picofarad that means 1 nanofarad if that is the case then just applying the series resonance formula that means xl is equal to xc you can calculate what will be the value of l required at 50 hertz that will be of the order of 10 to the power 5 henry which is impractical you cannot make any inductor or design any inductor of value 10 to the power 5 henry so therefore this is typically true for porcelain insulators or maybe porcelain bushings this sort of problem appears and just to show you as uh, some typical calculation let's say for a cable I'm saying that this cable capacitance is 3 microfarad. You all know that the capacitance of the cables are typically much higher than the insulators or bushings. For that, reactance is 1 by omega C for 50 hertz is about 1 kilo ohm. Let us say this voltage V, whatever we have applied, is just 1 kV. So it is 1000 volt. Typically, this R is low. We don't keep R very high. So, R is 0.1 ohm. So, then current at resonance becomes 10 kilo ampere. And if it is the case, then the voltage multiplied by 10 kilo ampere, it becomes almost mega volt. So, you can see how much high voltage can be generated by series resonance circuit of course 10 kilo ampere is too high a current we don't use that high but even if it is 100 ampere 
still then we are going to get 100 kV because it is x is 1 kilo ohm, current is 100 ampere, we straight away get 100 kV. So generating 100 kV to test that object is not at all a problem for series resonance circuit. Only problem that appears is that this, say if it is 100 ampere, voltage is 1 kV, so it becomes 100 kVA, the volt ampere rating. So therefore, this source, whichever is sub supplying this circuit, must have that kVA rating. At the same time, the transformer and the voltage regulator should also have that kVA rating, which is typically high, it is not low. So don't think that you can perform this experiment, uh, not experiment, this testing by using a simple variac which we have in our lab because variacs have much lower kVA rating. So we are require a different type of voltage regulator. So please remember this practical point that because of the kVA rating, we cannot use a variac. We, use, we have to use a different type of voltage regulator. I will explain it in the end of today's class. So what I am saying that capacitance of the typically is of lower value here because we are testing insulation. And so L should be higher. Moreover, capacitance depends on the test object. So it is not in our control. So therefore, L has to be adjusted to achieve resonance. We cannot uh, adjust C because C is not in our control and we cannot adjust frequency. So we cannot adjust C, we cannot adjust frequency. So to achieve resonance, there is only one parameter that we can control, that is the inductance. Now, this is how to do it, because as I said, that if, since the test object on the right has a lower capacitance, so requirement of L is high, XL is equal to XC. But how do I do that? We cannot design such a high inductor, high value inductor. So we try to use the common knowledge of our electrical engineering. So what we do is we don't put the inductor directly at the high voltage circuit. What we do, we put a transformer in series of the test object. You can see here, this is the high voltage side of the transformer and then low voltage winding then we put the L there. Now there are two advantages here that happens here. One, you all know if it is L then this is on the low voltage side. When you, what is called on the low voltage side, if I I refer it to high voltage side, then it becomes that inductance multiplied by trans ratio square. So if this trans ratio is high, the effective inductance that appears on the high voltage side is much, much higher. So I can have on the Voltage which is nothing but the old refer to the high voltage side. So we can achieve the voltage across the inductor because the voltage across the inductor is also 100 kV. Now, if I put the inductor directly on the circuit, the high voltage circuit, it has to withstand 100 kV. So instead, we put just a transformer which is much easier to design for 100 kV. So this transformer secondary will have 100 kV, whereas the primary, depending on the trans ratio, will have much lower voltage. So this inductor that we are using is a low voltage inductor. Now there is a big advantage in that. Why? Because we have to vary the L to achieve resonance and varying L at a higher voltage. That means if I put this inductor directly on the high voltage circuit and if we try to vary the inductance 
on the high voltage side it will create a lot of problem whereas varying inductor on the low voltage side is no issue so there are a lot of such advantages of using this transformer in series with the test object and putting the variable reactor on the low voltage side of the transformer supply is given through the same technology or same manner that i have low voltage ac source then through a voltage regulator we have a fit transformer and in this case we straight away are using as simple one is to one or one is to two maximum uh, this uh, feed transformer this is the circuit we use now now one more thing that now i have to explain that how do we perform the test that means how do we do it step by step so while testing what we do we first connect the test object here then switch on the circuit but don't apply a high voltage we apply a low voltage say 10 volt 20 volt to this secondary and then we adjust the l and achieve the resonance at that low voltage, 10 or 20 volt on the second day. So what happens is at that low voltage, the current is not that high. Therefore, the voltage across the C and L is not high. But now once resonance has been achieved, then the voltage across C is simply I into XC. That means it is proportional to current. And current is directly proportional to the voltage because it is v by r of the circuit so now if i increase the voltage the voltage across c will increase according to the voltage regulator so that means uh, i can control the voltage regulator and control the voltage appearing across c that means once again i am controlling at low voltage but the voltage which is actually appearing across the stage voltage is getting proportionately changed. This is a great advantage in controlling the entire circuit. So I repeat, we don't do the resonance at high voltage. We apply a small voltage of the order of 10 to 20 volts. I, we achieve the resonance by varying the reactor. And at that resonance condition, we keep or rather we vary the voltage using the voltage regulator and then the voltage across the test object also gets proportionately changed. This, uh, this is how we actually perform the test in laboratory. That means if you are the person who has to do it, you have to do it in this procedure. So please remember that it is one thing to know the theory, but it is a completely different thing that how I implement that theory in actual life. So this is the procedure what is to be done. Now, similar to the testing transformer, I told that there is a casket connection of testing transformer. The same concept is here also that if I need say 500 kV as output, then even if we use this transformer and reactor, it is very difficult to use one transformer. So what we do, we use two transformers, the secondary in series, and we use two reactors, which are placed in this primary, or that means the low voltage side of this transformer. Now there are two reactors, L1 and L2. So they will be reflected on the high voltage side and the net inductance is L1 prime plus L2 prime because they are in series. So when I have to achieve the resonance, I have to vary L. But one thing we have to be very careful that if it is a 500 kV or 400 kV as output, and if we have two such inductor transformers set, we have to ensure that the voltage is equally divided. Otherwise, what will happen? That one transformer unit will get 300, another will get 100 kV. 
Now that's not at all a good solution. So how do we achieve this uniform distribution or equal distribution of voltage? The answer is very simple that the two inductance must be varied in identical manner. Now, how do we do it? Here comes a very simple solution that they have to be driven by a mechanical mechanism through a gear arrangement that if it varies by a certain amount, the same way L2 will be varied by the same amount. So they are mechanically synchronized drive. So that is also a very important aspect of this circuit. And similar to our previous one, the second transformer, which is in series with the first transformer, one of the terminal is, that is that bottom one, is at the voltage, which is equal to the output of the first transformer. So if the overall output is, let's say, 400 kV, then the output of the first transformer will be 200 kV. And therefore, the bottom of the second transformer will be at 200 kV. So we cannot place that particular transformer on ground. And hence, we have to put them on insulating structure. So this is similar to what I have explained for the cascade transformer connection. Now I move on to another topic, which is called cable testing by testing transformer. This is a very interesting aspect. On the left, I am showing a diagram where this cable is connected across a testing transformer. And this C represents the capacitance of the cable. Now, if I draw the equivalent circuit of this one, then you can see this is the equivalent circuit of the transformer and this is the C. Now, if I remove LM because LM is much higher, so it becomes a series RLC circuit. Now, in this case, if please remember that the inductance of the transformer is fixed because this is the leakage inductance, whereas C depends on the cable type, length of the cable, etc. So we don't know exactly what will be the C. But it might so happen that for a particular value of C, this L1 double prime plus L2, this might create a resonance. This is called accidental resonance. We didn't mean it, but it happens. So what will happen? At that resonance, there will be very high current flowing and this transformer will get damaged. Moreover, even if, if you can argue that, okay, we can always understand that, or we can always make it in such a way that C will not cause resonance. Some sort of calculation you can do. Yes, that is true. But remember that this low voltage of this transformer is typically supplied from our normal low voltage supply. Now this normal low voltage supply, which we are getting from our power utility, may not have sinusoidal waveforms. In fact, it never has sinusoidal waveforms. So we can apply Fourier series analysis and we can see what are the different frequency components. So there will be third harmonic component, seventh harmonic component, etc. Now, although the magnitude of the fundamental is always much higher compared to third or fifth or seven, it might so accidentally happen that this series inductance and C, there is a resonance for maybe fifth harmonic or maybe seventh harmonic, not for the fundamental. So what will happen that even if we have taken due care that C will not cause a resonance at fundamental frequency, due to the distortion of the voltage waveform, we might get an accidental resonance for, uh, for let's say, higher order harmonics fifth or seven. Even though those magnitudes are lower, since it is series resonance, the current may be very high. 
So this sort of accidental resonance has happened and that has caused havoc in the laboratories. So for this, this is all explained here so you can understand. Now, here, if I use series resonance circuit, what are the advantages? Now, what happens in the series resonance circuit? And moreover, there is one more point I have forgotten. Let's say this is one is the resonance, see accidental resonance that can damage it. Whereas in series resonance circuit, our resonance is intentional. So there is no question of accidental resonance happening. Another thing is here, let's say this capacitance. This capacitance is of a cable or is of a bushing and we are testing. Now if the manufacturing is of not high quality, this object, test object may fail, may fail in the testing. That can happen anytime. If that happens, then this capacitor, that means this test object will be short circuited. Or in other words, this transformer is short circuited through this object. Now two things happen. One is it damages the transformer. Secondly, this capacitance, there will be a huge explosion. In fact, in our own laboratory, we have seen once a huge boom happened. Now, in the case of series resonance, very interesting thing is there that in the case of series resonance, again, let's see this one, the series resonance circuit. Remember, this C is of the test object. And we have adjusted circuit or rather the L to achieve resonance. And suddenly this equipment fails because of poor quality. What happens is that the moment this capacitance fails, the circuit is no longer in resonance. Isn't it? Because when XL is equal to XC, the resonance occurs. If the capacitance fails, then XL is no longer is equal to XC. So there is no resonance. So the current is maximum only at resonance conditions. So when the C, that is the test object, fails, actually current decreases instead of going up. It's an automatic protection of the entire circuit. That's a, that's a beautiful thing that happens in series resonance circuit that if the test object fails, then instead of current being increased, the current gets decreased. That is what is being explained here. Uh, the test voltage waveform I have already said that uh, since we are achieving the series resonance at 50 hertz, typically that voltage will be very high compared to even if there is harmonics present, those voltages will be much lower in percentage. So waveform will be very closely equal to sinusoidal. Another interesting application of the series resonance circuit that happens is called uh, or is in the measurement of tan delta. Typically, we use a bridge circuit called shading bridge for measuring the dielectric dissipation factor. Now, in this dielectric dissipation factor, and if you look in the shading bridge expression, I'm not going into that, then you will see that tan delta expression, whatever comes, is contains a term omega. Now, if we use a, a testing transformer for this tan delta measurement, because sharing bridge is a high voltage bridge, so we use a high voltage and measure the tan delta react real high voltage, not at reduced voltage. Now, if we use a testing transformer to generate the high voltage, then in, in addition to the fundamental frequency, we can also have harmonic uh, frequencies present due to the non-sinusoidal I mean, non input voltage or due to the presence of the iron core of the transformer. Therefore, the tan delta value that we get, that may not be the tan delta at 50 hertz, but typically the tan delta is measured or reported at 50 hertz. 
in the case of series resonance what will happen for higher frequencies the frequency is a no matter so the impedance is this as you can see on your screen r plus j omega l, j n omega l minus 1 by uh, j n omega c remember that the circuit is made resonance only at fundamental frequencies so for all other all other uh, frequencies what will happen as the frequency increases the inductive reactance that is the first part n omega l that increases capacitive reactance decreases and what happens the net zn increases as increase uh, frequency increases therefore what happens is that this current that flows through for higher order harmonics that gets much reduced this is one advantage that fundamental frequency of the circuit uh, fundamental frequency current of the circuit is much higher compared to the higher order uh, frequencies secondly the voltage drop that is uh, coming across the inductance that will be much higher compared to the voltage drop that is appearing across the capacitance. Remember, our uh, resonance is achieved only for fundamental frequency, not for the other frequencies. So, as the frequency goes high, if the voltage waveform is non sinusoidal, then for higher order harmonics, the most of the voltage will appear across the inductance, not across the capacitance. So across the capacitance, that means the test object, we have the fundamental frequency, which is at resonance. So the voltage is very high amplitude. And the other higher order harmonics, they are, even if they are present in the source, but when they are present across the capacitor, their magnitude is very low because higher order harmonic, the most of the voltage will appear across L because the reactance of L is much higher at higher frequency. So, all this together effectively makes the voltage waveform across the capacitance to be very close to sinusoidal. And therefore, if I use this circuit for tan delta measurement, then we get the tan delta value very close to the target frequency. And if it is 50 hertz, so resonance is at 50 hertz, we will get the tan delta value at 50 hertz so this is another major advantage of using this so there are two basic very basic uh, uh, specific application of uh, series resonance circuit for generating high voltage one that is for testing cables two for test for uh, measurement of tan delta that is dielectric dissipation factor now is there any disadvantage of this circuit? Yes, everything has its disadvantage. One is series resonance circuit cannot be used to test objects which have very low capacitance. This is a, this is of course an advantage. I uh, sorry, disadvantage. So mostly these are used for cables and similar high capacitance object. Another disadvantage that you will have to understand uh, practically that uh, under series resonance condition the current is comparatively high and how how high typically it could be of the order of a uh, one kilo ampere also now when i say one kilo ampere you really don't have any idea uh, how much it is how problematic it is so i give you an example then you understand see in any electrical circuit we have to make physically some connections right so i go back to this diagram here you see this cable or anything that has to be physically connected so there will be the connections so at this junction point there will be some contact resistance where we are connecting the cables out at the terminal so these are called typically contact resistance at the junction and this contact resistances we try to make very low, but how low? You just tell me. 
Okay, I give you an example that I make it very low. It I make it one million. The contact resistance. Making it much lower makes a lot of problem. But let's say it is one million. Good. Now, if the current is one kilo ampere, so how much heat is generated at the contact resistance? So 10 to the power 3 square, 10 to the power 6, I square multiplied by R, which is 1 million, 10 to the power minus 3. So 10 to the power plus 6 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 3, it is 1000 watts. Do you have any idea how much is 1000 watts? It is equivalent to one of, the, you know, you must have seen the heaters in your home for boiling water. You can see the red hot heaters. They are typically 1000 watt heaters. Now we can see that for a contact in this circuit, if it is one kilo ampere, even the contact resistance is one milio, there will be 1000 watt generated at that contact point. And that, if it continues for a longer period of time, you can imagine what will happen. The material will melt because of the high temperature. And that's a big problem. Sometimes it it's an automatic welding that happens that you cannot disconnect it later on. You have to cut it. So when we are handling our currents of the order of kilo ampere, things are completely different. Please try to remember this point that handling 100 ampere is something, handling 10 ampere is very easy, but handling 1 kilo ampere, not at all easy. We require very, very specific connections, etc., to take care of such high value of current. So please remember this point wherever you may be working later on. If at any point of time this situation comes, please take suitable uh, steps. I have already said that we require a special type of voltage regulators for using or for generating or varying the low voltage. So we have three types of uh, setups. The first one is the best one, but the most expensive one. This is called a motor generator set. So as I said that we have typically three phase AC supply coming from our power utility. So what we do is we put a synchronous motor. Now this synchronous motor is getting the supply from three phase AC. And so it will run at a constant speed. Then this motor will drive an AC generator. Since it is running at constant speed, this generator will, it is also a synchronous generator. So it is generate a 50 hertz or from only. So the output or form will be purely sinusoidal. This will never happen if we use something else. So this is the best possible setup but it is very expensive because these motors and generators are special motors because they are all synchronous motors, synchronous generators. So you uh, have to spend a lot of money. And how do you vary the voltage? It is very simple because the field winding of the synchronous generator is supplied from a DC source. So you can control this DC source voltage, which is generally low voltage and accordingly your output voltage will vary. So we get a smoothly varying output voltage of 50 Hertz waveform through this motor generator set. Only thing is that your efficiency here is not so good because overall efficiency is the product of motor efficiency and generator efficiency. So that will be another disadvantage. But if you can afford it, this is the best possible uh, arrangement that one can have. A relatively simpler solution that we get is called an induction regulator. This is typically we have it in our power system lab, probably we'll see later on, but we don't use it in our high voltage lab. Here actually it's a basically a transformer, but it's not a rotating transformer. 
but we have a stator winding similarly we have a rotor winding this rotor winding means it is not continuously rotor uh, rotating one but it is a geared arrangement by which we can rotate it by 180 degrees this rotor can rotate by 180 degrees or in other words the axis of the rotor with respect to the stator axis can be rotated by 180 degrees now if it is an one is to one transformer so on the right side if you can see the phasor diagram if i have the stator voltage and then you can see electrically they are connected in series so the output voltage is stator voltage plus rotor voltage phasor summation and if it is one is to one if both the voltages are v then you can see when they are in phase that means rotor axis is in phase with the stator axis the two voltages are added so you get 2v voltage if the rotor axis is in 180 degree opposite to stator axis then the output voltage is v minus v that is zero so effectively our voltage variation becomes zero to 2v so if it is 250 volt supply or 230 volt supply our output will vary from 0 to 460 volts like that and since it is a geared arrangement it varies very slowly so you get a relatively smooth control of the output voltage as i said that if it is for a not a very high kilo kva supply these induction regulators are quite good choices so that's why our boss system lab where the kva rating is not required to be high they use these induction regulators which hopefully you will see in the next semester i'm not uh, i'm hoping that pandemic will ease out otherwise it is a really unfortunate that you don't see all those in front of your eyes the one that we use in our high voltage lab and the one that is most commonly used in the power circuit of the power utilities are called the automatic voltage regulators or you will later on see you will hear a lot in your life that is called avr avr stands for automatic voltage regulator typically the circuit that is used is called a bug boost method i will explain it now just look at this diagram carefully this is a very interesting circuit you will like it if you hear so there are two transformers here one is this p and s on the left side p for primary s for secondary it's a one is to one transform then there is another one transformer that is bug post transformer this is also one is to one but this is connected in series with the line, whereas this PS transformer is in parallel with the line. On the right side, this is the isolating transformer, so forget about it. That's uh, the feed transformer. So primarily our target is from input to the primary of the feed transformer. Look at this circuit only. Now here. What is happening is that on the secondary of this PS transformer, there is a brush that is just like our, you know, that auto transformer, there is a brush, there is a brush. This brush can be moved, but this is not manual, typically moved through again a geared arrangement, motorized drive. And it is connected in such a way that this primary of the bug boost transformer is connected to this brush and the other terminal of the primary is connected to a switch which has two positions. In the boost position that is connected to the top of the secondary, the bug position it is connected to the bottom of the secondary. Let me explain it in this way that let us say that the switch is in the boost position. So then look at the connection, start from the brush. So from the brush, we go to the primary of the bug boost transformer. Then on the other side of the terminal, it comes to the switch, goes to the boost position, then goes to the top of the winding and comes back. So therefore, if I take the polarity of the voltage as shown from 
bottom to top. So what is the polarity of the voltage applied to the primary? Look at the voltage polarity, bottom to top at the secondary of the PS transform. So if this is the case, then the voltage that appears on the primary of the bar push transformer is from right to left in the boost position. Yeah, I repeat, if the polarity is from bottom to top, and if the switch is in the boost position, then the voltage that appears on the primary of the bug boost transformer is from right to left. And you always remember that the induced TMF of transformer of primary and secondary, they have a 180 degree phase difference. So the voltage that appears on the uh, secondary of the bug boost transformer is from left to right. Or in other words, it is in addition to the supply voltage. And since both the transformers are one is to one, so maximum voltage that will appear across the S is the same as the input voltage. And that voltage will appear across the primary of the part post transformer. It is also one is to one. And so therefore same voltage will appear across the secondary. So if the input voltage is V, then the secondary voltage of the bug boost will be V. And it is in the buck boost position, so it will be added. So we will get to V. What happens in the buck position? You can see here again in the buck position, when the switch is in the buck position, then the voltage that is applied across the primary of the buck boost transformer is from left to right. Again, I repeat, when the switch is in the buck position, then the voltage that is applied to the primary of the bug boost transformer is from left to right. So the voltage that is appearing on, uh, on the secondary of the bug boost transformer is from right to left, which means it is in opposition to the input voltage. So if it is a one is to one transformer, so if the input is V, there will be a voltage V on the secondary of the bug boost transformer, but in phase opposition. So it will be V minus V, it will be zero. So our voltage range becomes again zero to two V. And here, these two transformers, the bug boost transformer and the PS transformer, they can be designed suitably because they are static machines and we do it for proper KV editing and that's how we operate. And this is used in uh, not only in lab, particularly labs like us, our high voltage lab, but it is also used for power circuits. Now, if I say that, then you will not be convinced. So what I'm doing is I am showing you some photographs. Then it will be uh, clear to you. So let me show you that. Uh, first, I'm showing you the automatic voltage regulator that is there in our high voltage lab. So if this, uh, you come to our lab later on, you can see this. So you can clearly see this is a pretty big one. And there are motorized arrangement here. Through that motorized arrangement, we vary the voltage in this case. Then I will show you a such a same thing but used in the substation so here you can see on my mouse you can see it's moving there are three such uh, units because it's a three phase of here so you can see these there will be motorized arrangement at the bottom through which the brush will move and inside the tank and the voltage of the line is being automatically controlled this is called substation voltage regulator. This is also automatic voltage regulators. And the laboratory type induction voltage regulator I'm showing now here. So this is the winding on the left side. You can see here, there is a stator winding inside, then rotor winding. Stator winding on the outer side, rotor winding on the inner side. And this is how it works. You see, there is a motorized arrangement at the top. So through that, this rotor will rotate smoothly inside. 
and accordingly as i said the axis of the stator and rotor is changed inside and you get the voltage variation this is how these uh, regulators that work that i wanted to show you and also i wanted to show you very importantly is the casket connection yeah here it is which in otherwise you will not be able to see yes see here it is uh, the photograph taken at the central power research institute bangalore uh, sorry this is in hyderabad cpri so in the on the back side you can see two 500 kv uh, testing transformers and i told you now that these testing transformers are not placed on the ground so you can see that they are placed on insulating supports and this is the right one is the uh, first unit whereas the second one is in series with the right one so the second one is at a 500 kV voltage with respect to ground so you can see that the second one is at having a much higher insulating support on which this one is used and then we get 1000 kV as the output of this entire setup. Uh, this is a tremendously high voltage, which not so easy to you know apprehend for your uh, level. This is very, very high voltage, 1000 kV. And here again, I repeat, you can see the static shields. You can see the bushings of the transformer, and we can see the static shield. Then vertically, you can see these are the measuring units. They also have static shield. All the high voltages, they always work based on the static shield. So this is another view here of this uh, cascade testing transformer. You can see this is the unit number one in the front, unit number two in the back. And you know, we are standing right in front of it. And just to give you an idea, how big it is now you can clearly understand from our height that how big this entire setup is and then i can tell you that these are so expensive so we have to take all sorts of measure i mean measures so that these testing transformers do not get damaged they are extremely expensive equipment Then I will show you another in interesting diagram here. This is the world's highest transmission line voltage. Uh, you will be uh, proud to know that the highest wor world's highest transmission voltage is not in US, not in China, it is in India. It is 1200 kV AC transmission line. This is uh, at uh, Madhya Pradesh at the substation called Veena. But this is the testing arrangement for this 1200 kV setup. Here you can see the hanging one is the insulator string. This is the 1200 kV insulator string uh, that is being tested where we are standing in front of it and you can see how big it is. And on the inside, on the right, you can see this is a bundle conductor. Today, I have already shown you in another diagram where four conductors were placed in a bundle. So I, I can show you again so that you get a very clear idea what is this bundle conductor. So here you can see on the right, it will be coming on your screen on the right here you can see there are four conductors which are in bundle now i will change it and i will go to this one where uh, you can see 10 conductor bundle here on the bottom right it will come on your screen you can see that this is how 10 conductors are placed in a bundle so 
the current carrying capacity is 10 times of individual conductors and individual conductors are just like any transmission line conductor but then overall current carrying capacity becomes 10 times so for the same voltage your uh, MBA rating is 10 times secondly you can clearly see since all the conductors are electrically connected so the effective diameter of the conductor has increased significantly and therefore even at 1200 kV corona does not appear so these are the technologies that have been demonstrated all practically uh, designed and developed in India and one can be really proud of that then I show you what is called this today what I showed you these are the series resonance generators this is at the bottom you can see it's a 260 kV 83 ampere test set so here you can see that test object is on the trolley here because this has come for testing now these are very heavy equipment maybe it's a very big uh, capacitor a high capacity high value capacitor so they are still on the um, this one what is called the trolley and then the connection is taken inside the laboratory through the series circuit and testing is being performed so these are i'm showing you so that you can have a visual effect of this whatever i am teaching today uh, in this class so I think that's all for today. Uh, if you have any questions on this. OK. If it is not, then I have one uh, thing that uh, next class is uh, 19 so it becomes 26 that 26th january uh i mean will it be a good one for class or if not then you have you can have to give me an alternative date what date i can get for the next class 